that yeah. uh, that is going to focus on the poetry of Jeroen Sonnevi, a Swedish poet who writes <coughs> about Europe, among other things. But this session is about politics, and it's uh, uh, the politics of European inclusion and exclusion so far as Scandinavia and the Baltic area is concerned. <coughs> and we have four, four speakers. We're going to start with uh, Timothy Helwig, who is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science here. And uh, he received his uh, PhD from the University of Minnesota. And his research interests include comparative politics, mass political behavior, European politics, and political representation. The second contributor is Toivo Round, who has for many years been a professor in our Department of Central Eurasian Studies. And he's a historian, really a historian of, of Russia and the Baltic, who covers a lot of territory and more recently has been focusing on the Baltic area and even uh, teaching, I think, uh, Scandinavian history, for the, which we haven't taught <laughs> ever uh, in this university until Toivo started. And his, uh, his, his writing focuses on the Baltic area, Estonia and in Finland in particular. The third speaker is Per Nordahl, who is a visiting professor in IU's program in International Studies. And Per is from Sweden. He received his PhD in history at the uh, at University in Umeå in northern Sweden. And his research centers on policies for immigrant integration in Scandinavia and the implementation of these policies. He was actually very uh, much involved in this sort of thing himself. When uh, for four years up to 2006, he was director of the Swedish Immigrant Institute, where he managed a number of European Union projects. And the final speaker is Ulf Björk, who is a professor at the School of Journalism at our Indianapolis campus. He received uh, his PhD in communication from the University of Washington, Seattle, and he's worked as a journalist in Sweden including uh, assistant editor for Eastern Business Magazine and news editor and announcer for Swedish, uh, uh, for the Swedish Broadcasting Corporation. And so uh, we'll just start with, with Tim and then uh, actually move down to who <laughs> at the end. Okay. And then we'll have time. Each, each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Okay. Well, thanks very much, and thanks uh, for all of you for coming here today. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to, I, I'm not really a specialist in, in, in Swedish politics or, or Scandinavian politics per se, but kind of look at, at Europe more generally and more broadly. So I think it's good that I go first, and, and also uh, I, I, I want to kind of take the big picture on this and talk about uh, three, three big picture trends, I think, in terms of Western Europe today that, that fit in with this theme of, of uh, inclusion, isolation, and national identity. Uh, in a globalized world, and, and then after they'll talk about those trends, think about two, three consequences of these trends, really, uh, 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 for, for politics, the political consequences, really, uh, the implications for politics. So, so the first of I think this big trend in Western Europe today is really, is really the economy. Uh, it's what um, a lot of uh, recent election outcomes have turned on. Uh, what really is the focus on a lot of European publics today is how well uh, the economy is doing. Uh, and I think in Western Europe, more so than the United States, it really was an environment of, of economic stagnation in many countries, in many of these large welfare states, even before the uh, uh, economic crisis. And so we see today you have this financial crisis that come on top of this uh, sort of more, more stagnant economies, which has really turned into an economic crisis. Um, something that I'm very interested in, and, and in things of thinking about the relationship between uh, the economy uh, and this idea of exclusion and, and, and exclusion is really uh, 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 the different policies within Europe uh, that countries can take to try to assimilate people into what I think is an economic downturn and more importantly, and more long-term organizationally, uh, uh, changing the economic structures in post-industrial economies, right? You have this, this evolution really of the, over the past uh, 30 years, but intensively so, in a lot of the northern European countries about moving from an, uh, industrialized economies to post-industrialized economies. And um, it's interesting to look at these things. Uh, uh, really, it's a move from industry, industry to kind of tertiary services and in, uh, industries or, or maybe the public sector. And there's kind of two tracks that different countries can kind of engage in. One is to, uh, 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 is to facilitate the development of this private service sector. 
uh, low wage, low, high employment uh, kind of in se sector. Uh, and this really has sort of been the US and the Anglo model where you have an, 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 a very distinct strategy, which I think is very, a, a more inclusionary strategy might be in terms of dealing with uh, economic structural change, might be represented more by a Scandinavian model or, or a social democratic model where you see the public sector really taking a lot of the, 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 the brunt of employment and job creation in these post-industrial economies. And I think this economic change, though it may not be played up as much for a, a change in economic organization, though it may, may not be played as much in terms of identity and inclusion, really has a big consequence for how countries will deal with economic organization, demographic change, uh, 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 immigration, migration, things like that, these different models of economies that, that, that we're seeing kind of develop uh, in Europe today in, in response, as I said, economic stagnation, the crisis, and also uh, change in, in, in the nature of these economies. So that's sort of the big, first big picture trend in Western Europe, I think, is economic change, uh, a, a structural change in the light of stagnation. Uh, a second trend that I'm really interested in, so I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, is, is uh, the, the relocation of policy control along at the same time as you see a change in, in, in organization of economies, right? You see in Europe today, uh, with the European Union, you see a lot of shift in the policy-making authority away from what the nation state can do, the policy jurisdiction up to the European level. Uh, so I probably don't have to tell many of you this, this shift is going on. You almost see this evolutionary change, and it only, it only seems to be heightened to the extent that the uh, 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 the principles and institutional change put forth by the Lisbon Treaty will go into an effect. But, but just today, just to name some of these areas that yet the Europe controls rather than uh, nation states is in the area of monetary policy, of course, within the Eurozone. Um, this is not the case for Sweden. Uh, it's sort of somewhat the case for, for Denmark uh, with, with the krona peg within this, this, this band of currencies. So there's many exceptions to this, but but there seems to be a, a movement towards more and more centralized control of monetary policy, of course, with the centralized bank. Uh, trade, of course, commercial affairs is controlled by the European level. Uh, many countries' legal systems are being supplanted and surmounted by the kind of common law system being uh, promulgated by the European Court of Justice. Uh, and this, of course, has lots of implications for citizen rights, minority rights, human rights, um, a lot of pressure for harmonization of these rights. And of course, also uh, Europe putting the fundamental uh, 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 rights uh, and its protection of minority rights within the Copenhagen criteria for uh, membership status, essentially a stamp that, that countries have to achieve some sort of hurdle, which I think is very appropriate for today's uh, discussion. And of course, you see joint control with Europe and member states over immigration and rules for asylum policy. So there's this idea that, 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 that really there's this relocation of policy control, not just at the European Union level, uh, but also you see, I think as a consequence to this, a lot of pressure for more control at the local level in many European countries too. Uh, talk about devol the devolution in Britain or delocalization in France. Um, uh, uh, countries being more regionalized, uh, regional tendencies being coming to the fore, uh, probably shows up in many Scandinavian countries as well. Uh, so together, I wonder if these two trends kind of represent an empty core of the nation state in Europe. And that's a, that's a big important theme, especially when we talk about inclusion and policies for inclusion. Uh, if there's less the governments can do, or at least the perceptions of this, uh, uh, then, um, then I think that citizens are going to be looking more towards Europe and providing a, a common solution to many of these problems and, 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 and recognizing that perhaps the, that their nation states can do less and less in a lot of these policy areas. Um, uh, my th okay, so my third big picture trend is related to the last one, which really is to speak about the idea that this relocation of control, I think, is really acknowledged. There's some interesting findings, this is my, my research is in today, about to what extent do citizens recognize or acknowledge this relocation of control? And what are the implications for democracy and for democratic accountability? Uh, so I, I recently did a survey in the field, and I did Sweden and the United States and several other countries. But it's interesting to just look at the Swedish-US comparison just briefly uh, on this point. Um, uh, so we asked the question, uh, so who's responsible for the economic conditions in your country today? You know, who do you think? And of course, well, I don't know if of course, but uh, the results in Sweden and the United States were 
we're, we're, we're inverse relationships. The United States, uh, over half the people have said it's, it's our government's policy that really affects our economy here in this country. And only about 12 or 14 percent said it's, it's the broader world economic system. This, is, this was just before the crisis, so perhaps it would change today, but uh, it was back in the early fall of 2008. Whereas in Sweden, uh, over half, 54 percent precisely said it's really the world economy. The broader economy really affects the Swedish, Swedish uh, economy and Swedish economic conditions. And only, a, uh, you know, only 16 percent said it was of voters in this representative national sample that I conducted said it really is the, the nation's government that, that, that controls the economy. So I think this, this has a huge implication, especially when we think about Sweden being a large welfare state and a welfare state that's, that's, that's admired and we look to to solve problems of uh, redistribution and things like that. If only a smidgen of Swedes uh, now believe that smidgen is under a bit of underselling it, but only a small share of Swedes actually think that their 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 government, which they generally hold in high regard, can do do something in terms of the economy. We have to wonder if the whole welfare state model is being uh, a, a bit uh, less credible. Looks a little, little bit less credible today than it did. In, in decades past, so that's that's sort of my third uh, and my third trend. I think you can, if you analyze public opinion data uh, about uh, attitudes towards this this relocation of control. Um, so, about oh, three more minutes. Uh, so, so, oh, oh, and so, 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 yeah. There's this relocation of control. I'm sorry, and and then and then and then, and then, and then with that, of course. Uh, the third point, I'm sorry, is, is really sort of a rising social diversity, which I think other people are going to talk about as well. But, but really things like uh, 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 we do see a, a greater percentage of a percent foreign born uh, in many countries approaching 12 percent and, and above. Uh, and this, this percentage of foreign born uh, individuals, which is sort of a proxy for, for religious ethnic minorities, has really grown if you, if, as a share of the labor force, as much greater as a share of the labor force than is the population in general. So that sort of re-emphasizes the, 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 the broadening diversity uh, uh, in society. Um, so I'll just uh, uh, say, say three quick things about what I think are some broader comp consequences of these three trends. Uh, again, this, the economic change, the control, and, and this social diversity. Uh, one is, I think, one of the consequences. I think the European Union has really come out and being a being a catalyst for trying to worry and do policies for ass assimilation here, uh, assimilating minorities, assimilating uh, 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 cultural, linguistic minorities, immigrants uh, to a greater extent than national governments. This could maybe be debated because it's a blanket statement, but I think national governments have almost used the EU as kind of a shield and allowed themselves to sort of turn inward I mean, and think more about uh, constituencies and, and domestic politics. Uh, local politics and letting the EU take care of these nasty, allowing the EU to take care of these difficult decisions about uh, about migration policies. And I think that's part of the that, that has produced a, a, a kind of politics that has been more local and more contentious, perhaps because uh, national governments seem to let let the EU handle that issue. Uh, 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 a second point, of course, is changes in. Um, what we, how Europeans feel their national identity um, uh, 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 in terms of the consequence of these trends, right? I mean, uh, uh, an interesting thing, of course, is to ask different uh, uh, people in different European countries to what extent do they really feel attached to the supranational product or feel like they identify with the European pro project, right? Um, in Sweden, looking at recent data, uh, about 39% of Swedes say they feel attached to Europe. In Denmark, it's about 42%. In Finland, it's about 30%. Um, so an interesting question is, are these numbers going to rise in the future, right? Um, we can't answer that question for sure, but we can look at, at countries like Denmark uh, that have been in the EU, for, in the European community for a longer time and wonder, has being within the supranational institution fostered feelings of supranational identity? And the question, answer to that question is it's not. It's hard to say. In, in Great Britain, in Greece, in in, in 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 the Netherlands, actually only about a third third of individuals feel report feeling a sense of attachment to Europe, even though they've been in the Union for quite some time. So, um, interesting question. Maybe one that I can uh, talk more about later if we if we if we talk about this theme of identity more. 
is to what, what is the relationship between feelings of national identity and supranational identity? And is this, a, is this a zero sum relationship? Is it a negative relationship or a positive relationship? Uh, uh, and, and there's been some interesting research that says it, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not just negative. It's not just, if I feel more like a citizen of, of Sweden, I feel less like a citizen of Europe. There's actually some interesting contingencies going on that, that, that political science research has, has, has spelled out for us. So anyway, so that's the sense of national, changing sense of national identity, implications for European identity is a second consequence. And really a third consequence that I'll just briefly touch on uh, of, of these political changes is uh, electoral change, right? So many people might be familiar with the with changes in, in sort of uh, far right, xenophobic, nationalistic, anti-European political parties in Europe. Uh, 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 examples uh, 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 of these parties like the Fr Fr French National Front getting 15% of the votes, uh, the Freedom Party in Austria doing very well, uh, the Danish People's Party about 30% of the vote polls and national elections very consistently over the last, I'd say, four electoral cycles. And, and, and the Sweden Democrats today, uh, though not in Parliament because of uh, electoral rules and the threshold of needing to attain 4% on a national-wide basis, are coming very close, and polls suggest that this, this, this Democrat, the Sweden Democrats are, should attain the, 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 the uh, leap over the threshold by the time when the next election will take place, September 2010. Uh, so interestingly, even in, in many of these countries that haven't seen this kind of, of, of representation through parties of anti-exclusionary or isolationist parties are now seeing that come to the fore. Uh, and of course, that's an implication, interesting implication. I think it fits with my other point about by letting Europe handle more of the Im Im immigration policies and, 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 and rules for asylum immigration. That has turned national politics more, I guess, reactionary or more, a little more inclusionary. Exclusionary, I'm sorry, uh, in, in its stance. Um, so I've talked for long enough. I've got, I, I can, I can expand on these things that we have time. Thanks, for, thanks for the, the broader European background. So I'm going to focus a bit more closely on the Baltic area now. Thank you. Um, that's uh, your uh, second point. The conclusion was a nice segue to uh, to what I'm talking about because um, uh, I'm actually going to talk about the Baltic Sea region as a whole. And my basic point is that the range of identities has greatly expanded in the last 20 years with the collapse of communism. During the Cold War, we had an artificial period when identities were um, uh, very much kept in check, in many ways frozen. In the Baltic republics of the Soviet Union, national identity was a natural defense mechanism which everyone uh, developed and, and uh, practiced. Um, but there were great limitations on what you could do during the Cold War. Uh, Finland, for example, could not join the EU. Um, and um, one of the few ways in which uh, a regional identity was developed was, uh, was the Nordic Council, which was founded in 1952 and which Finland was able to join only in 1955 after it got its sovereignty back and was able to join the United Nations and <coughs> the Soviet military left the base at Borkala just outside Helsinki. But there were great limitations here too. They couldn't talk about defense because there was no agreement on what, what sh should be a Nordic defense policy. The Western Nordic countries were in NATO of course, but Sweden remained neutral, which had served well since 1814 and uh, in the Second World War, perhaps not heroically, but at least uh, Pragmatically, it served it well. And uh, Finland would have loved to have been neutral, but uh, of course it was, and many people in the West thought Finland was part of the Soviet Union, uh, those who perhaps didn't know too much about the situation. But certainly there was a phenomenon called Finlandization, which meant that Finland was, in fact, uh, in many ways uh, subordinate to the wishes of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, my point is that with the collapse of communism, the Baltic Sea area has opened up once again, uh, just as it had been really historically, um, and we have a whole range of, of new identities here. Um, one of the themes, of course, is European identity, and that, that may still be the weakest identity in, in the region, and indeed it's, it's, a, uh, it's still an identity that's under construction all, all across Europe because of its remoteness, because of its abstractness. Uh, 
it's not clear to the average voter why uh, one should develop and, and practice a European identity. What is the payoff? Uh, if you're informed, of course, you would recognize that, as, as Tim suggests, the EU uh, interferes, intervenes in the lives of, of people more and more, but it's, it's not obvious to the average citizen. Um, and uh, there is a remoteness, and, and the question, of course, is, uh, what is, what is the European language? There's not a single one. There's a lingua franca, of course, and that is English, which is taking over. But there's no European language. What is European culture? What is the territory of Europe? Uh, or as Henry Kissinger famously asked, what's the, what's the phone number for Europe if I want to get the European view on, on, on some policy question? Well, there is, of course, the Lisbon Treaty, which uh, may go through soon, but who knows, uh, uh, based on, on the Czech President Václav Klaus, uh, its objections. Um, there may be a, an EU foreign minister or the equivalent of that, but it's, it's still something that's very much under, under construction. Uh, we have, for the first time, at least um, in recent memory, the possibility of a Baltic Sea identity. Uh, which would include the Scandinavian countries, the Nordic countries, and would also include Russia. Uh, the problem is that Russia is a little bit awkward to fit into this <laughs> because of its size. Uh, Russia doesn't like to think of itself as just another state in this region, uh, having been, of course, a former superpower and having pretensions to playing a major world role once again. Uh, <clears throat> So in some ways, and in, in initiatives like the Northern Dimension, which you may be familiar with, um, the idea has been to sort of cut Russia down to size by limiting uh, it to the region that borders on the Baltic Sea, such as Kaliningrad and the region around, uh, around St. Petersburg. Uh, and of course, much of that is, is for very practical reasons, i.e. Chernobyl-type uh, nuclear plants that may blow at, places like Sosnovy Bor uh, near St. Petersburg. Um, and, but it's, it, it remains a huge question of uh, how, how you integrate Russia in, into, this, into this process. Um, one of the most interesting new kinds of identities is what you might call the Nordic Baltic Eight. That is, the five Scandinavian countries and the three Baltic states that uh, renewed their independence in 1991. Uh, some people use the term Balto-Scandia, an Estonian uh, geographer, as early as the 1930s, used this term Balto-Scandia. Um, and it's related to, I think, a, a shift in the thinking of, uh, of the Scandinavians. It's interesting that uh, Iceland was the first country to recognize Baltic independence. Uh, the Finns, true to their policies and practices during the Cold War said, we'll, we'll wait to see what others do. We're, we're not going to jump into this right away. Um, but Iceland uh, was the first world country to recognize the Baltic, independence of the Baltic states, and, and followed by, by Denmark. Um, a shift in the thinking of countries like Sweden that um, really, I think, had a bit of a bad conscience about the Cold War and the fact that Sweden recognized Soviet annexation of the Baltic states. Um, and uh, as, as Karl Bildt, the conservative prime minister at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union said, um, borrowing a phrase from Soviet or from Russian, post-Soviet Russian thinking, um, the Baltic states are, are near abroad. Uh, that is, it did not serve as well to ignore the Baltic states in earlier decades in the 20th century. Uh, now is a time to make sure that they are integrated into the West, that they become part of the European family once again. It's much better to have independent Baltic states next door than uh, somehow renewed dependencies of, uh, of a resurrected Russia. Uh, but it's interesting that this Nordic Baltic eight still tends to be five plus three. <laughs> that is, <clears throat> the three aren't quite accepted on the same level as the, uh, they have not been accepted, for example, into the Nordic Council. It's still Nordic, Baltic, working together. 
<clears throat> the um, Nordic Council continues to exist as it did during during um, the Cold War, when it played an extremely important role, for example, for Finland, because it, it allowed Finland really to cement its identity as a Scandinavian state. Uh, as late as 1951, the Royal Institute of International Affairs published a book called The Scandinavian States and Finland. I.e., Finland was not quite accepted. And in the 20s and 30s, Finland was sometimes referred to as a Baltic state, like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. But in the second half of the 20th century, certainly before 1991, Finland was, Finland worked very hard and it was accepted as a Nordic and, and Scandinavian country by most of the uh, rest of the world. Uh, in fact, this identity has been kind of watered down, the Nordic identity, because of the number of other identities and especially the demands of membership in the European <coughs> Union for Denmark, Sweden, and, and, and Finland. The Scandinavians complain that we don't have all the resources in order to be, to, to be able to handle everything. The EU demands uh, too much of our time, uh, even though there is a sense that the Nordic connection is the family connection, uh, and the EU is, is a sort of cold, bureaucratic, uh, more remote connection. Uh, but it can't be ignored because it's, it's always there. Moving down <clears throat> in terms of the levels of, of, of size, let's say, um, there's a renewed Baltic identity <coughs> among the three Baltic states, um, which is probably never, uh, stronger than it's ever been. Um, in the 1930s, even though there was a, an alliance between the Baltic states, uh, it was really just on paper. And when push came to shove in the crisis of 1939-1940, uh, the Baltic states each engaged in what you might call disastrous soloing, going their, their own way, <coughs> each going their own road, and, and not working together in any sense. Uh, the relationship uh, does lack uh, kind of cultural warmth, although Lat uh, Latvia and, and Lithuania do have that, uh, but the Estonians tend to look more to Finland and, and more to Scandinavia. But there's a strong recognition that um, they need to work together, and they also recognize that the outside world thinks they're almost a, a, a single entity. Uh, it's not by accident that everything that's happened in the Baltic States in the last 20 years has happened at the same time. They joined NATO at the same time, they joined the EU at the same time, uh, they got out of the Soviet Union before it collapsed, remember, in August, September of 1991, not in December, but August, September of 1991, uh, all three together. There are smaller kinds of uh, cross-border identities uh, that you see. Um, the Swedish-Finnish archipelago between Stockholm and, and the uh, Oland Islands and, and the Turku region, for example. Uh, Copenhagen model, aided by the bridge uh, that, that is now there. Or Estonian Finland, or uh, Helsinki and Tallinn, uh, two capital cities. Uh, some people call it Dalsingi. Uh, there's talk of having a tunnel, like the channel in the west, a tunnel built uh, between Helsinki and Tallinn. And, and today, you can literally commute to work from one, one to the other, you can take a boat at uh, 7.30 in the morning and be at work at 9 in, in, in either case. And some people do that. And that's becoming more and more uh, likely. National identities have not disappeared, to say the least. Uh, they're still very much there. Um, and I think uh, to relate to um, Tim's point um, about zero-sum games, I think there's more and more recognition that people can hold, modern citizens can hold, can and should hold multiple identities, and they're perfectly capable of, of doing this. And uh, a European identity, uh, certainly, or let's say a Nordic-Baltic identity, does not uh, take away from uh, some form of, of a national identity. Um, 
and certainly all of these countries, uh, except for, let's say, the larger ones, uh, maybe Germans and Russians on the Baltic Sea, uh, all the smaller countries uh, have a strong commitment to their national languages, and particularly the smaller ones, like the Baltic peoples, are wrestling with the question of what, what is the future of their language in, in a unifying Europe. Um, the European Union has 23 official languages now. Uh, when it was first founded, it had four, and English, of course, was not one of them. And English has become such a lingua franca that the European Union policy has now become, uh, you should know two foreign languages, because one of them is going to be English, and, and that's the one that really doesn't count anyway. You should know another one. But it's striking that the countries I've been mainly talking about, the Scandinavian and Baltic countries, uh, are way at the top of the list of European countries that, uh, that know, uh, know foreign languages. Luxembourg, as you might guess, leads the way with 99% of the population knowing a foreign language. But right up at the top also are uh, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Estonia, are all up uh, at least 87% of the population know, know one foreign language. Uh, Finland uh, is farther down the list with only 61%. But they're still in the top half of the, of the EU. As you might guess, at the bottom are countries like the UK, and for some reason Hungary, uh, which, is, which is a little surprising, perhaps. Um, and uh, there are some interesting things also, I think, happening with, with national identities that we could talk about if, if you want to later. Um, for example, in, in, in in countries like Estonia and Latvia, where there has been very little state tradition in the past, uh, the state has become more and more accepted as an element of identity, but largely for its cultural role, that is, its protection of culture and protection of the language, that the Latvian or Estonian state exists not for, God forbid, military glory or something, but to ensure that a Latvian and Estonian language continue to exist on the face of the earth. And finally, uh, we can go below national levels and talk about subnational identities, uh, regional identities in places like uh, southeastern Latvia, Latgala, for example, uh, southern Estonia. There's actually a South Estonian language or a dialect, if you prefer. Uh, linguists debate that. Uh, or the very interesting case of, of the Sami, uh, formerly known as Laps, who are both subnational but also transnational because they exist in uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and, and for that matter, in the Cold Peninsula of, uh, of Russia. And it's interesting that uh, uh, EU membership has uh, encouraged the Nordic countries to come to terms with minority issues. Uh, you know, you look back at the treatment of the Sami historically, uh, the Scandinavian record isn't, isn't better than anywhere else. Uh, <clears throat> the Norwegians and the Scandinavians in general before the First World War uh, thought that the best thing they could do for the Sami is to assimilate them as quickly as possible and, and, and get them off reindeer herding as quickly as possible because this was a primitive form of existence that, that should be consigned to, uh, to, to history. Uh, and there was definitely a horrors of the Second World War definitely did raise consciousness in Scandinavia and, and the rest of the world, I think, as well. Uh, and, and our uh, awareness and consciousness of the importance of a variety of cultures and, uh, and ways of, of living. Um, and remember that the Copenhagen criteria 1993 did talk specifically about protection of minority rights. So um, the Sami have, have benefited from that as well. And there has been a real rebirth and uh, real activization of the Sami population across, across the board. At least, uh, as you might guess, in, in Russia, but there's also the smallest uh, number, or largest in, in Norway, then Sweden, and then finally Finland. 
Okay, I think I've taken my time, so thanks so much for the Yeah, and now let's move to, to Per Nordahl. Yes, uh, well, actually, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, a little from my own experience, as you were referring to the, the during my time as a director of the Immigrant Institute in, in Växjö in Sweden. Uh, it's supposed to be an, an archive for historical material, but it's also supposed to work on uh, current event integration. Uh, that part of the, the, the mission, unfortunately, wasn't really dealt with. It was mostly the historical material that was collected. So I was trying to live up to the uh, bylaws and regulations and, and actually do that and, and uh, that brought me into an, a really interesting situation where I um, through the, my interaction with local authorities and uh, NGOs and, and uh, different agencies um, was was uh, struck by you know, their unawareness of this whole issue about identity construction. I especially, especially remember I was engaged in, in uh, we were supposed to, to celebrate the, the national, you know, like 4th of July, 6th of June. And, and the county called me uh, to organize this together with the museum and so forth. And I had the, the courtesy of asking, uh, why? Uh, well, it's, it's a party. You know, we have to celebrate. Yeah, yeah but why? Genius ethnically. This whole issue about our relation to others has not really been addressed in any you know, serious way earlier, than, and, but joining EU certainly raised that issue. On top of that, uh, the growing international migration certainly um, triggered that issue as well. And, and uh, not the least with the latest um, uh, expansion of EU, which included a number of um, countries where Islam is a predominating um, religion, this was further enhanced. Uh, so in the case of Sweden, the, the whole integration issue, um, there's been a, a shift there from, from uh, more like a, a policy for immigrants to a policy towards integration of immigrants, uh, which I, I guess is a, a step in the right direction. But in reality, when you start looking at what, what's actually been done, it, it wasn't that big a shift. It still was a policy about assimilation rather than integration. Uh, there might be a lot of uh, nice talk and, and all these policies, but in reality, when it come, came to, to uh, the time to implementation, it was all about assimilation. And, and this was, to me, further um, sort of highlighted when I, I looked at, I, I'm sure you're aware of this um, migration uh, Migrant Integration Index that's put out of this group in, in London, where Sweden comes out with flying colors that's topping uh, the EU countries there as far as all the nice policies relating to, to uh, there are six different categories, access to nationality, anti-discrimination, labor market access, long-term residence, uh, political participation, and a family reunion, and Sweden sort of outshines most of uh, the European countries in that respect. Still, living in the country and seeing the, the, how that works, uh, it doesn't. Uh, actually, uh, our um, responsible uh, minister, Sabuni, came on TV uh, just a couple of months ago because there was this whole debate in, in the, the media um, because there was a study showing that the, uh, the segregation of Swedes and immigrants is increasing and that the density of these ethnic uh, pockets uh, within uh, the major cities is just being more and more uh, intensified. So when the minister responsible for integration comes on TV actually discussing the failure of Swedish integration, then you start wondering what's, what's going on here. Um, and I think this, this is really uh, you know, my main interest to look at the problems of integration because regardless of whatever policies EU or the government uh, decides on, if there's no implementation stage, you, know, you can decide whatever you want. And this is really what it seemed to me uh, where we are uh, in Sweden today. Just looking at some basic figures, 
uh, I mean, the, the transition from being this pretty much homogeneous country to today where the country is uh, basically, I think it's uh, 14, almost 15 percent of, of foreign stock in the country, in a really short time period. This has put the country, uh, in, in terms of articulating the relation to others, in a stage where uh, they're grasping for any you know, help or, or clues as to what to do. Unfortunately, I must say, that my experience with this is that they seem to be, uh, well, I guess it's sort of a Swedish tradition and doing the, sort of the policies and the nice uh, uh, formal side, and they're, they're, they continue to bark up that tree all the time. Um, I, I took the liberty of looking at uh, some of the fund or the, the projects that's currently being funded, and uh, I mean, there is the whole demographic transition and the dem demographic problem that's been addressed uh, through local planning and so forth, but also uh, with a great support from all these different uh, EU funds the social fund and the integration fund and then the refugee fund and then all of those. Um, but um, they're all pretty much geared towards uh, refining those nice policies that the index is referring to. Uh, and in, in my world, well, it's, it's not really the immigrants that are excluding themselves. It's really the whole society that's catered to the whole uh, exclusion thing. And, and this goes back to this whole uh, thing about, uh, well, is it integration or assimilation we're talking about? And in my mind, it seems to be that it's continuation of this assimilation policies, uh, but it's more labeled integration nowadays. Uh, that is really the problem. And, and none of these pro projects that are running now is really addressing these issues, which to me seem to be uh, somewhat scary, especially if we're looking at uh, some of the political developments uh, in, in Sweden and also in, in other European countries for that matter. Um, the last two elections, one of the major changes there has really been the, the Swedish Democrats, this xenophobic ultra-conservative uh, party that's ma making headways and, and uh, gaining a lot of uh, seats in local assemblies. And the last thing I saw uh, on some recent polls, they actually would gain access to the, the national parliament if there were elections today. Meanwhile, uh, the bureaucracy, the major parties are, are grasping for ideas how to deal with this. But it seems like the, the, the main route they're still trying to take is focusing on the um, policies polishing policies and, and trying to refine them, those and, and make them more efficient, where really it's about um, the whole society and the, the understanding of, of what integration really uh, involves. And uh, working at the Institute, which to me uh, was like a clear-cut case where history met uh, current events, the experience of being the other through the ex immigrant experience in, in, in America. I mean, it, it, it's obvious. But um, nevertheless, um, it, it, the, 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 those who funded the activity there wanted to pursue this more implementation-oriented uh, uh, activity that I was trying to engage in. But somehow, the, the academic side of on the research side they just didn't get that. It was just sticking to the old uh, methods and doing studies and showing how it is, not really engaging in uh, this dialogue and in the interaction, which the institute could have functioned, uh, you know, as a nice platform for. So, uh, as a result, two of the major, but this was after I left, two of the major finances uh, left. So. This nice institute with this internationally renowned uh, collections is hanging by the thread because there's no one willing to, to finance it. So if you're willing to, to let institutions like this basically um, go, uh, then you start wondering what's the rationale for that and uh, what to do uh, when it comes to, to uh, sort of practical integration activities especially looking at, at the, the, uh, uh, the, 
the kind of projects that's been launched and also uh, the political development, to me, it, it's not a, a pretty picture that we're starting to see um, in Northern Europe. And to me, that's kind of scary, but I hope we can perhaps get back to, to that. I mean, I have a well to draw from here. I have some questions about that, but first we'll listen to all of yours. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, pick up a little bit on Toyo's point about uh, national self-identity and, and focus uh, on, again, staying with Sweden, as Paris introduced here, uh, Swedish attitudes toward inclusion in Europe and European integration uh, as reflected in uh, public opinion about the EU. Sweden has been a member of the EU now for 14 years, and the Eurobarometers, these polls they take showing attitudes about the union and more populations of member countries, member country, countries uh, tend to show that Swedes are among the most skeptical and unenthusiastic. I think the Finns are down there too, and the British too. Uh, and um, obviously there was some hesitancy even before Sweden joined the EU. There was a referendum held in the fall of two, uh, 1994. Uh, Sweden was set to join in 1995 project that had broad backing of the government and the political establishment. But the government had promised that uh, the referendum was legally not binding, but that they would honor this, uh, whatever the outcome was. And the outcome, again, was not a ringing endorsement, 52% for. And then in the years after Sweden had joined, uh, support waned further. So for most of the late 1990s, uh, more, more people were opposed to union membership, although Sweden was already in, than were supporting it. Uh, and further evidence of hesitancy and skepticism about EU membership, of course, came in 2003 when another referendum, this time about whether Sweden should adopt the euro as a currency, uh, yielded a defeat. 56% uh, uh, almost said no. Uh, and of course, Sweden, as a result, is not, used, it's not on the euro. Uh, and in order to try to understand this skepticism, I, I think it's Worthwhile, or at least worthwhile, to attempt to do so by looking at Swedish mentality and going back a little bit in history. Uh, four years ago, uh, Sweden commemorated an event 100 years ago, which I think is large, my impression was largely forgotten. It was the dissolution in 1905 of the union between Sweden and Norway. And I've looked at press coverage in both countries at the time of the dissolution, and it is radically different. As you might expect, the Norwegians were simply jubilant after centuries of foreign domination by the Yule Danes forever, and then by the Swedes for about 91 years, um, they were finally independent, and this obviously was something to celebrate. The Swedish uh, reaction was far more melancholy and negative. Uh, there was some pride taken in the fact that the Swedish government was determined to let Norway go without resorting to military means, and that gave the country some prestige. But what pervades a lot of these observations by writers at the time is this profound sense of loss by losing Norway, as it were, Sweden had somehow given, this was the last vestige of great power, the great the age of Sweden being a great power that began in the early 1600s. Uh, and there, needed, there was a need for something that made the country once again uh, generate a national pride and gave the country a sense of, of uh, uniqueness in the world. And finding that took a couple of decades at least, uh, but by the 1930s something clearly was taking shape. In 1936, the American journalist Marcus Childs published the uh, very influential book, Sweden the Middle Way, which uh, was read by officials in the Roosevelt administration and supposedly even related to the president himself. And all of that was duly noted with great pride and satisfaction in Sweden. That Sweden was being noticed once again. Uh, and what Charles did was, of course, many of you know this, uh, to recap very briefly here, uh, he held up Sweden as an alternative, a middle way between, on the one hand, unfettered capitalism, American style, and the ravages it had brought during the Depression, and then, on the other hand, regimented socialism um, of, of the Soviet Union. Sweden offered, through an understanding between private industry and the socialist government, and between labor and industry, an alternative that seemed to guarantee a welfare state, a welfare system, while at the same time retaining a vibrant and uh, private sector at the same time. And this then built momentum in the decades to come. As we've already said, Sweden was extremely fortunate in World War II by staying out of the conflict, more or less honorably, as Toivo said, um, and came out of the war, of course, in fantastic shape, particularly compared to, to its neighbors, but generally in Europe. Uh, in the early 60s, Sweden ranked fourth, I think, in GDP per capita after the US, not surprisingly, and then after Luxembourg and 
Switzerland, which had its particular ways of fixing the GDP. <laughs> Kicking out people didn't make that much if time for that. Um, and um, I can remember that I'm dating myself here, but you know, this was known as the record order, the record years, and everything seemed possible. Uh, at the same time, the onset of the Cold War gave Sweden a chance to be a middle way also politically by acting as a sort of broker or whatever you want to call middleman between the East represented by the Soviet Union and the West represented by, by the US or led by the United States. Uh, uh, advocating non-alignment and neutrality and reaching out to countries that had similar aspirations, uh, many of them newly independent uh, developing nations. Uh, and if anybody embodied this, uh, this, this Swedish aspiration to greatness in, in the, on these terms, of course, it was Olof Palme, who was a significant social democrat political figure from the mid-1960s and then prime minister in 1969, and who really saw himself and his country as an actor on the international stage, uh, criticizing America for Vietnam, criticizing uh, the Soviet Union for occupying Czechoslovakia, and then reaching out to leaders, or trying to reach out to leaders of developing countries. Um, then, of course, this begins to fall apart in the early 70s and in the decades that follow. Uh, the economy uh, turns worse, the uh, oil crisis and unemployment, and then Palmi himself is removed from the stage when he's assassinated in 1986, arguably past his heyday at that point. But clearly, I think nobody with the same aspiration or ambition was there to, to pick it up or, or, or pick up his, his mantle after that. And then, of course, with the Cold War ending, the idea of a middle way becomes largely irrelevant. The West, the popular perception perhaps, was that the West and capitalism has, had won. And so what was the need for some sort of middle way uh, that Sweden had played? And I think all of this, all of these circumstances together, uh, made Sweden reconsider her relationship to Europe. In 1971, with Olaf Palme in charge, Sweden had said that they she didn't want to be part of the EU. She could exist beside, that was the, the term, beside the EU, not outside, but beside. I'm not quite sure what the difference was. But, uh, and retain this, this perceived position internationally. Uh, well, that changes, of course, then, and then they begin to prepare for membership in the early 1990s, and that then passes. Um, the problem then comes, comes to coming to terms with what does this mean? What does it mean for self identity and for this perceived role that Sweden had played? And clearly, there was a great deal of skepticism in the early years of membership, as, as polls indicate. And I think, uh, in some ways, the, the high, high point of that, that skepticism is, of course, the rejection of the euro. Uh, what has happened since then, however, is that if you look at polls, and these are the Swedish official statistics polls, and the questions may be a little different. They're slightly different from the ones that Tim quoted. But uh, support has steadily increased since, oh, I think, 2004. The latest poll I saw in, is from May 2009 by the Central Statistics Bureau of Sweden. And that indicates that support now is about 55. Uh, what has really happened though is that opposition to the EU has gone down. It's in the 20s now. There's a big, fairly big, don't know continuum, but it's, it's always not, not more than people are supposed to. Even, even if you look at the um, big question of 2003, uh, adopting the euro, that's about now statistically in a dead even. It's, it's uh, as many yes as, as there are no's in this. And, and what I suppose that indicates, if you look at what people cite as reasons, I think at long last uh, there have perceived benefits of union membership have, have materialized. Less expensive food, more concern about the environment, uh, the better economy sometimes credited union membership as well. I also think there's an interesting sort of aspect to to, and, and I, in some ways peculiar to Swedish, and when arguments were being made for joining the EU, people said, one argument was that we're already part as a heavily uh, export-dependent country, we're part of an international market, being in the union will give us a say, will give us some influence over that. The other one was that Sweden could no longer act alone in the interest of peace and security, it was necessary now to be part of a European collective and do so. Now both, both of those valid reasons were valid. But then there also was this sort of almost messianic idea, I think, that Sweden would be a member of the EU and then reform the union in its own image, make it more Nordic, I think ultimately more Swedish, by stressing things like environmental concerns, which I think to some extent, at least the perception is that this is, has happened, not perhaps as much as, as some people would have wanted. Uh, and also by uh, 
making the union more democratic and more transparent, um, which you can argue has happened on. Sweden and Finns together have had that project. And the EU is too bureaucratic and too secretive, and it should be more Nordic in it, it should be more open. Uh, above all, though, I do think it's uh, a matter of this increased um, acceptance of EU membership. I think it's also an acceptance of a change, and again, Another loss, perhaps, of, of the sense of being a unique country and facing the reality, again, that Sweden, as was clear to some extent already back in 1905, is a small country on the outskirts of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for four very interesting comments. And the, uh, the floor is open now for questions or comments uh, from, uh, from the, you, you can take, you know, get up and say what you think or you can ask questions. <laughs> Damn. I'm going to ask a question in part as, as perhaps the only person representing the evil Danes. <laughs> um, and I guess I was interested in, in the comment that Scandinavia says that it's a global economy and that the U.S. doesn't. Um, I can't speak for the other Scandinavian countries because I don't know anything about their economies. The Danish economy is incredibly export-led. Would you suspect that that has something to do with the way in which the Scandinavians think about their economy and, and perhaps the fact that they don't think that their governments can do that much about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's right. I, I think it's, um, these figures I was, so Denmark is uh, slightly less than, than likely than Sweden's to say about 40% of Danes say it's really the world economy and, 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 and about quarter of them say it's their government. So Sweden, I think a lot of the, these different perceptions do are housed in reality uh, based on the size of the domestic market and therefore the greater reliance uh, on the international economy. So in Americans, it makes it rationally look towards our large national economy as the reason for that. So yeah, it seems to be people understand this part uh, about what their governments can do and, and the infringement, I think, of their national capacities by the world economy. Anybody else want to say something about that? Well, you, one of, you know, news coverage often is, and I'm sure it's done in Sweden and Denmark too, they'll follow the dollar <coughs> yeah. religiously because a lot of them get paid in dollars. So yeah, it goes down. I've actually right? been to farmers' um, houses in Denmark who have the Rotterdam market on their yeah. computer running continuously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 85% of what's produced in Denmark is exported, so it's very difficult to ignore the world. Maybe I'll, I can add something as well. Uh, <clears throat> Denmark, of course, joined the EU already in 1973, so a much longer experience there. Um, and yeah, the Eurobarometer figures, uh, the latest one I have here is from the fall of 2008, very much dovetails with what Wolf said, that 59% of, uh, of Swedes said membership in the EU is a good thing. And Denmark was almost near the top at 64%. But what's interesting, I think, about Denmark is that it's also, I remember the Economist uh, keeps referring to not the evil Danes, but the awkward Danes, because they don't quite know what to do here. And, and the, uh, at the same time that they're accepting this, they're also probably the most polarized in terms of, of views, because you've got. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about the Euro Parliament elections, but uh, you know, political scientists uh, might use the term second order. Uh, that is secondary importance because people don't show up for it. Well, the last elections in June of this year, uh, all of the Baltic and, and Scandinavian countries, except for Lithuania, uh, definitely showed increased participation. I'm not sure what the Lithuanians were doing. They were at the very bottom, like 21% showed up. Uh, but uh, clearly, I think the economy has something to do with it, so, and, and, and the sense that they, uh, maybe something could be done here. But uh, a lot of these Euro Parliament elections have been used for, for protests. Uh, you've got this June movement, uh, get, out of, get out of the EU. In, in both uh, Sweden and in, in Denmark, historically, you've, you've had such movement. But, um, and there is this very much, I think, point Wolf made, very important point. Also, I think with Denmark, that um, uh, let's face it, the Danes got in for economic reasons, and that was it, uh, because the British were in, they had to follow the British. And there was a very strong sense in Denmark, certainly in Norway, in Sweden, 
um, that we're better than the EU. Our system is better than the EU. Um, we, uh, not just the welfare state, but we have shown how you transform society in a civilized way, in a nonviolent way. And uh, the big question, of course, is all these terms about Scandinavian exceptionalism. Yeah. Is the Scandinavian model exportable? Uh, can anybody else do this? Or is it only in countries like this, small countries that tend to be homogeneous? Of course, they're no longer homogeneous, and that's, that's part of the problem that, that they're facing today. Um, but there are a lot of similarities, I think, between the, uh, the Danish and the, uh, uh, and the Swedish attitudes, and, and the sense that, yes, uh, we can, um, <clears throat> the Danish government tried to sell the euro uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the referendum by saying, okay, uh, we can transform, uh, we can help transform the EU from the inside uh, if, if we're closer, more closely involved. Um, and uh, another term that's often used is democratic deficit, <coughs> uh, that the EU has this and it needs to become more open, as Wolf said, uh, and part of this process is more, more power to the uh, European Parliament, uh, which really has grown in, in, in the last couple of decades uh, since the Maastricht Treaty. Okay, other comments, questions? Yep. Yeah, and I think we're, we're yet to hear something explicitly negative about the European Union. Could you speak up a little? <coughs> um, it would appear to me that on, on paper, the Europe, European Union economic integration has some obvious benefits, but there's some very serious political, cultural, and social backlashes against this European project. And surely some of these things are, are negative when we talk about the erosion of state control, um, the stagnation of, of large welfare states. Um, these, uh, the, the supplanting of legal systems, um, control of trade and commerce, and if we could hear some of the uh, some more negative things, <laughs> I would be happy to hear. Hard euro skepticism. Is that what you want? <laughs> well, what, what, I, what I want to hear is, I mean, this, this whole this the European project isn't exactly working out the way we thought it would. We you have. In France and in the Netherlands and now in Scandinavia, some, some very serious violence reactions. Well, there's, there's in a sense that uh, well, we've got to, it's got to work out because uh, if you look at geopolitically or at the world economy from that perspective, it seems to, uh, from an economic standpoint, it's in Europeans' best interest that the European project work out both for the common commercial policy and and and. and Goods and services, and also now to create a zone of monetary stability in Europe that can can doesn't have, it can diversify the world's finances, and also not get into this this massive uh, devaluation and deficit spending cycle that that, that got on in Europe much in the 70s and and the 80s. So in what in the economic part is supposed to we sort of have to be positive or, or hope that, that that works out, and therefore there's sort of two things that that. That, that political scientists or people focus on in trying to get to that. One is the problem with, with, with what Toyota just mentioned in terms of the institutional problems and the democratic deficit. And so that hasn't worked out very well in terms of having a Europe that represents the interest of its citizens. And there's been a lot of movement to try to strengthen the role of the European Parliament and European party, parliament, party groups to try to increase and make Europe produce policy outputs that more of the citizens want to produce. The other issue, I think, is the more um, identity-based issue and support for integration, and a cultural support for, for the European project. So not institutional, but more bottom-up, and that's kind of what was talked about here with, um, with, 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 uh, uh, with, uh, with attitudes toward uh, uh, support for Europe. And so in that sense, a positive aspect, it seems to be there is some stable and maybe growing attitudes on the part of Swedes, which are more skeptical than others, I think, and I thought Danes were quite skeptical too, but maybe I'm wrong, about it's Europe. Changing it's changing, it's changing, it yeah. seems like. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but, but I think there's a, a sense from sort of the, the chattering classes that, that Europe ought to be better work. It seems like the alternative is the not. The political classes? Well, I guess it's the political classes, yes, yeah, <laughs> I mean. It seems like it should work, and therefore, the alternative is a reactionary, kind of backward-looking, Isolationist kind of tendency, and uh, in fact, a lot of the uh, and on top of, 
and people thought that that might have happened uh, after this financial crisis, that you actually see the our worst fears come about, you see more isolation and protectionism, and it seems to be that hasn't been the case yet. So I think this current test almost seems to be, and it seems to, to hold up that maybe uh, 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 people really do have faith in the economic aspects of this, and we just gotta sort of fix the, the political and identity aspects to, to creating a stronger democratic Europe. I don't know who else wants to jump in on that. But. Yeah, I'd comment a little bit as well. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, maybe one more positive thing, uh, or one distinction, let's say, between the Finnish case and the Swedish and, and Danish ones. Um, uh, the Finns, interestingly enough, went in whole hog. Uh, they adopted the euro, they've done everything. They want to be the best pupil in class, so to speak. And their point of view is, is what the, uh, again, the Eurocrats and political scientists uh, call voice over sovereignty. That is, they say that sovereignty is overrated in a globalizing world anyway. Uh, how much control do we have over our fate? The best way to have some control is to be present at the table. And in many ways, our best friend in the EU is the European Commission, a supranational institution, uh, as opposed to uh, members themselves. Because uh, let's face it, the big countries, and this certainly is one of the one of the negative issues in the EU is that, uh, you know, the cynical view is that it's, it's basically run by the big countries. Um, and it's the French and the Germans. Uh, the British, if they wanted to get involved more, could, but they, they're very standoffish. Uh, as, as you probably heard, uh, the British conservative leader once um, uh, would like to have, if, if the Lisbon Treaty is not passed by the time uh, they have elections in, in, in Britain next year, uh, he wants to have a referendum. Um, but there's no question that size counts, uh, and, and um, the big countries have, have more power than, than the small ones. But um, you know, there's some interesting studies on, on perceptual size nowadays, and certainly the Scandinavian countries are bigger, <coughs> act bigger, or have a bigger impact than they appear. Um, in terms of their population, their punching ability, so to speak, in the EU is much higher. Uh, their, their GDP is higher, and uh, their influence around the world, I think, is higher, uh, partly because of uh, the size of their diplomatic corps and, and the perception that they're efficient, they're honest, and uh, they can help uh, on a world scale. Um, <coughs> certainly a negative thing is what I sort of jokingly referred to as, as the Hen Henry Kissinger issue, uh, uh, the EU has not been able to um, come up with any sort of unified security policy. And that's going to, in fact, be more and more difficult the larger it gets, with 27 countries and different interests. Uh, I'm not a great admirer of Donald or Rumsfeld's analysis, uh, ability to analyze, but the comments about a new Europe and an old Europe uh, did have a point to it in the sense of the perception of uh, what the policy, foreign policy of the, of the EU should be. Uh, uh, I mean, the Baltic states uh, are heavily involved in, in Afghanistan because they feel they need to be part of, they need to be, again, the best pupils, the best members of NATO to show that they, uh, they are part of a Western alliance. Um, in the economic sense, uh, there's no question that the uh, agricultural sectors have found this very difficult. And uh, in the Scandinavian case, because uh, inevitably the subsidies that they were getting, which were are very lavish, as in this country, uh, the agricultural sector simply could not continue under EU membership. And it made a painful adjustment. Uh, the number of farmers. In Sweden, it wasn't so important because there were very few farmers to begin with. But in Finland, you had many more. Uh, the number of farmers in Finland has declined drastically since 1995. Uh, so that's been, that's been quite painful. Uh, even though for the consumer, of course, uh, EU membership has meant lower prices in, in general, including for, for food products. Uh, just one other point, which uh, maybe is not so much negative, but an interesting one. Uh, that we ought to be aware of, I think, is uh, this is what you might call elite, elite versus masses. Uh, what's striking is that 
all the elites uh, in Scandinavia, and for that matter, probably in the EU as a whole, certainly in the Baltic states as well, uh, the political class, all think the EU is a great idea. Uh, they don't see any alternative to that. Uh, it's the rank and file members of the population who tend to be skeptical. Um, and um, that gap that creates problems as, as well. Although in the case of Scandinavia, there's, uh, there's a really long history of tending to trust the government. The notion of big brother is quite weak in Scandinavia. Uh, it's, it's more of a family notion that uh, uncle, uncle knows best. And uh, um, even in the case of, uh, of a country like, uh, like Finland, where the popular uh, public opinion remains very negative on the case on the issue of NATO membership, uh, the political class is moving closer and closer to this. And if they decide this is a good idea, they will probably bring public opinion with them. Pierre wanted to add something. Uh, just a comment on, on sort of the democratic deficit. Um, I mean, I remember the, the referendum there in, in, the, in the 90s uh, about EU and <clears throat> living up north. Uh, I mean, it was heavily yeah, against. Uh, yeah. As soon as you got north of, of Stockholm, Uppsala, yeah, into, uh, into the rural areas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there was no uh, hope and, and yeah. trust in. in, in um, and I mean, that was like an extension. It was far from up north down to Stockholm and down to Brussels was even further. So, I mean, <clears throat> no way. And, and uh, But at the same time, um, and this is to me part of, the, of, of the, the problem with not only Sweden but the other Scandinavian countries that, like you said, there, there is also this trust. Um, and and you're, once we're in, you're not supposed to rock the boat, trying to avoid conflicts and sort of roll with the punches. But at the same time, you also have a, a, a tradition or a culture which is quite passive aggressive. So people might, you know, to do the politically or appear to do the politically correct, but then in practice uh, do something completely different. And I think this is partly what we see when it comes to, to all these nice policies on integration. But in reality, there's, there's something completely different. And and uh, for the future, what this will mean, because I mean there is a, a demographic or, or a democratic deficit. Uh, to be reckoned with within the EU, and as the more the, the integration into EU will sort of continue, there will be more rifts uh, with the. Well, I, I think that the example of, of Ireland was an example of, of that too, where where they thought they would get the, the referendum for the constitution, but oops, didn't happen because the, the population thought otherwise. And I think that might well uh, apply to, to uh, at least Sweden as well. Although, I mean, there, there's, and this goes back basically to, I think it was uh, 76, when, when there was a shift in, in the programmatic and, and the, the outreach from Swedish industry, where they engaged much more actively in the, the democratic process uh, with their program. And suddenly you start to hear you know, the same set of, of answers and questions you know, on radio and media all over the place. And that has played out. I mean, people buy into that if there's no alternative uh, articulated. And as you said, Toivo, that all the, the political elite pretty much subscribes to, to the idea of, of uh, what EU stands for. So, but that doesn't mean that, that people in general will you know, have this gut reaction and, Become passive aggressive again. I, I think. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go I, I, I think one viewpoint. I think one negative aspect is that it is a very abstract notion. I mean, what it is being a European. There is the language problem. Is, is every time more countries come in, the language problem gets even more complicated. Uh, in the 80s, before there was a huge expansion, they had this initiative that they were going to have television without frontiers, which ultimately was supposed to foster more television programs from within the communities. The Swedes would watch more French and Dutch and, and other programs and essentially shut out the American ones, which dominated. Uh, and that project went 
virtually nowhere either. I mean, there's as much. Oh, well, you got the Eurovision Song Contest. Well, that's about the one. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I'm sure you're. I remember meeting. Oh, this was again before Sweden. Meeting this Irish student over here one time, and we figured out all we really had in common as Europeans was the Eurovision Song Contest. We could make fun of that. But, you know, otherwise, there was no sense you know, that we were Europeans versus Americans or anything like that. There, the idea, I think, for the most part, it's an abstract notion. And sometimes people make fun of it because regulations are passed down from Brussels. I remember in Denmark, one was you couldn't put the origin of the food on the product. They couldn't say Danish tomatoes because that violated the EU rules of free market. And so they insult that by putting little Danish flags on the tomatoes. But <laughs> they didn't actually say Denmark, but everybody knows what they know. <laughs> what, uh, well, I, I just wanted to clarify because Pear spoke a lot about assimilation and integration but didn't define it. And I just wonder what it, what it, the two look like, say in the back chair. If you if you have foreign uh, people there, and you, how would they actually be brought in if they were assimilated or if they were integrated? What well, if you assimilate, you sort of uh, throw out your your own uh, uniqueness and become a Swede. You become a sort of dark skinned Swede. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, 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 that's that's the idea at least. Yeah. The integration then it's like this two. Yeah two-way dialogue where both parties take part in the change. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, given the, the sort of modes of doing things in Sweden, uh, Swedes don't tend to really engage in that. There's a serve, I mean, we can have coffee and you know, be nice, mm -hmm. but, but when it comes to real power, forget it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you and that this, this is, I mean, uh, I, I remember when I moved from yeah. no, uh, north of Sweden down to south, that applied to me too. I was like an immigrant because I wasn't from there. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a really tight uh, knit system where you have to prove yourself, but there's not much of a willingness from the host to really engage in that process because it's it's historically uh, yeah. you know, a new. Well, Sweden was one of the first places where they allowed uh, immigrants to vote in local elections, not national elections, but local elections. Uh, how does that actually act? I mean, do, are people discouraged in some way from actually participating, or do they don't want to participate, or they do participate? What not that a form of integration? I mean, that's a step. Uh, the idea, yeah. yeah. I mean, the formal, uh, like, like I was referring to all these uh, policies, they're there. But I mean, you know how meetings can be run. It's, it's uh, you, you do it the other way. You know, if you don't stand up or sit when you're supposed to, you're out. I mean, it's so they're you, kind of uh, they're held at arm's length, and even though they have these rights, they don't. Very, very much so. I mean, if, if uh, there is some. How's the participation level? Yeah, what's by, the by uh, immigrants in local elections? Is it the same as Swedish, or probably not? Uh, no, it's not. Um, and and uh, I mean, there there are people trying, but you know, and over and over again. Uh, you, you hear all these stories about how they're being manipulated out of the system, and, and it's not because of the, the lack of attempt or willingness from the immigrants. It's just that it's this sort of invisible wall, uh, basically the same as with women, right? You know, there's these boundaries that it, it, you can't touch them, but they're there. Uh, and, and in the case of women, while well, they got organized and, and sort of engaged. In, in this dialogue and, and claiming their rights, where uh, in, in Sweden, uh, the immigrants, I mean, there were a couple of, of uh, studies, uh, what's his face, Lappalainen, uh, 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 and, and uh, the, the Uppsala sociology professor, uh, um, there were a couple of studies that were uh, presented just prior to the changing of guards when the, the conservatives took power that sort of was starting to address these issues, but with a conservative government, you know, nothing happened. Yeah. It's just get them out into work and it's supposed to you know, be fixed. Okay, Dan, you had your hand up. Well, actually, actually, you asked at least the first part of my question, yeah. so maybe I'll just ask the second part, which is, suppose you were to implement integration. Um, give me some concrete action. Oh boy. Because I mean, this is, to my mind, the biggest single issue that certainly Scandinavia faces, if not Europe. Uh, 
I remember uh, I attended a meeting of the Swedish club in Minneapolis and the keynote speaker got up and he was supposed to talk about something else but then it struck him you know why do we have this it's all about trust the sort of ethnic community engaging you know form, forming a, a group to be able to engage in a dialogue and, and negotiate a position within sort of then in Minneapolis and and basically it's the same process that I think we have to look for in, in, in Scandinavia too that just as women got organized and, and negotiated a position so must any other category trying to to uh, you know get into you know on the table by the table there uh, what I think is needed is to make the, the whole society aware of that this is necessar a necessary step to, to invite and uh, to embrace that process. Because otherwise you tend to atomicize uh, all these, I mean, you, you just look at them as, as individual, but in, in practice they're being excluded as a group, as immigrants. Uh, and then there, I mean, there, there's no force to counter that. So the, as far as programs, uh, there needs to be much more focus on, on the role of, of the whole society than what we do and don't do, which is, you know, that's a mouthful uh, mm -hmm. to get that going because, well, the, the way our culture, you're not supposed to touch those hot potatoes because, you know, hey, you might get into a conflict. Uh, and that's not good. But at the same time, I mean, especially in northern Sweden, where you, you're getting to the point where some of these communities have a hard time just providing basic social services, elderly care and all that. Uh, but, well, there, there's, there's not enough uh, manpower there no people and then when they get immigrants there well they don't let them in so uh, a set of programs where you actually engage in, in a sort of physical activities be it from sports recreation uh, sort of studies whatever uh, where you actually start I mean that's how basically um, I mean the, the ethnic integration here so sort of over time you engage uh, and assess what it means. I mean, that's really where people gain trust is through not but declaration, but practice that you know I, I can count on this guy or woman. Uh, but that awareness doesn't seem to be there right now. I, well, I'm, I'm currently in, in a dialogue with some of the local authorities in, in both. Well, there are two sort of sample uh, counties. Uh, where we're trying to address these issues. Uh, I mean, they can come out so off the record and say, we're clueless, we don't know. We, don't, we, we want to do good, but what do we do? And this whole self-reflective aspect, uh, it's like they don't get it. Anybody want to add anything to that? Just to yeah. try to make some leaps here. It seems to me from a perspective of what a lot of what's to be admired about Sweden and other countries in Scandinavia is sort of the strong sense of trust with, within, within the in-group. It's like uh, you've got, uh, what, what makes a very attractive feature of, of, of Scandinavian democracy is, is workplace democracy and also bringing the social partners with, with the parliament, right? You have to belong to these organizations, these associations. The, the labor union, and that works really well for the economy. Likewise, the consensus democracy works very well because the parties are very tightly knit, and you've got some good uh, relationships of, of party leaders across the party bounds, and you can you can advance things forward. So, if you try to map onto that very well 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 machine of uh, the, the 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 immigration aspect and the, uh, this other that come in this out group, now it's very hard to break into the tight bonds that pre-exist in. in Societies. Whereas in the United States, we don't have a lot of these good things in terms of our economies and our political system, but it also makes things more fluid and, and integration easier in, in the American system or more of an Anglo system. And there, there is a time aspect too. I can, again, dating myself, remember when people would say that the Finns were so alien that were coming to Sweden in the 60s that they would never integrate. They had a different language and they had a different mentality. And of course, they were, in essence, very, very similar to fellow Scandinavians. But I mean, that debate was going on, I remember, in the early 60s, saying that mm. this will never work. In fact, I was, when I was in school in Sweden, uh, one of the assignments in sociology that I got with it, it's Hungarian immigrants. Yeah. Was, we were supposed to find out just that. And so we went and interviewed the foreigners. Of course, the foreigners were Finns and Balts. 
And, uh, and what I found was exactly the thing that Pear has been describing. That is uh, Swedes who, you know, to us who were foreigners, they looked very much like Swedes. <laughs> and, uh, and yet the Swedish, we interviewed both Swedish and the, and the immigrants. And the Swedish, I, I, in the same apartment building, I wouldn't let my children play with those Finns. I mean, they're just horrible, you know, and they had all these really ugly stereotypes. And, uh, and of course, the Finns and the Balts were saying, you know, they don't like us and they don't want to be with us and so forth, and so we can't make any headway. It was exactly the same thing. Oh, now I think they're accepted more. And, uh, and in fact, there are a lot, a lot of Finns in northern Sweden. <laughs> Some communities are. Many one. Finns have returned to Finland. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Yeah. When Finland uh, reached the same level uh, economically in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, there's also a sort of second generation of, of Finns you know, who sort of, I think, feel they belong to both countries, but mm -hmm. really are, I think, truly integrated. I mean, there's not, nobody thinks about them differently just because they have Finnish last name. Brant, do you? Oh, I'm sorry. You, did you have something? To I say? did have a yeah. question. We'll take the, uh, Brant's question and then this young woman. You wanted to say something? Okay. Then we'll <laughs> yeah. take Brant's question. At that point, we'll wrap it up and, okay. and, and break. I just wanted to ask um, about the minorities in Sweden. Are th how are they citizens of Sweden? Do they have right to vote in national elections? Are they organizing politically? Um, I just kind of wanted some more information. If and and on related to our theme of inclusion exclusion, how do they v view the EU? Are they more in favor of the EU than your average Swede, or do you, or is that kind of a leap of faith? On my question. The the bulk of uh, all the immigrants have has come. Uh, I mean, th there was this uh, after the Second World War when Swedish companies went out and recruited mm -hmm. from the Balkans and Italy and so forth. And Finland too. And Finland too. Well, you had the common labor market from 50, yeah. 56 mm -hmm. when when they could move freely. Uh, but uh, it really started in, in with the coup in Chile and the, the, this massive flow of refugees from from uh, South mm -hmm. America. And, and uh, I mean, to some extent, they saw this as just an interlude and then we're going, trying to go back. So the, as far as wanting to integrate, not, well, it, it was a, a mix. One, one section of the Latin Americans sort of gave up and wanted to integrate and the other didn't. And there, there are big, big differences between, uh, like the Bolivians, I don't think there's an unemployed Bolivian in, in Sweden, whereas the Chileans have much more a hard time. And why that is, I'm not sure. It's just how they happen to relate culturally. And, and, and the same goes for uh, you know, different African groups. You know, they, they, they assimilate very differently or mm -hmm. integrate differently. As far as the political uh, participation, uh, you have the right to, to vote in the local assembly, but uh, the national assembly, what is it? Five years. Yeah, five years. Yeah. Five yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, I mean, local authorities and, and the bureaucracy you know, is trying to engage uh, in, in in this, but at least in a formal way, uh, in this dialogue, trying to draw people into activity. But it's like with the elbow. Uh, somehow you, you get to a point, and then you don't get any further. Uh, and the, the, the problem with this is that my experience is that Swedes themselves don't get it. I mean, it, it's something that you're brought up with, and you know all these sort of uh, little markers, what to do and not to do, and it's a pretty much a tacit system that it's not explicit. And that's why it's also so uh, difficult for Swedes to explain. You know, because they, they, they can't see this bag they're sitting in. Mm. So, I mean, the, in that respect, I think the, the American experience, where people have the ability to identify where, with kin and friends and so forth, that, that's been the other, that's gone through basically the same, you know, building their churches and schools and, you know, all the same things that immigrants in Sweden now are trying to do. It's easier to understand. And, I mean, I have numerous experiences where once you get a chance to start explaining this, it's like turning on the light. Ooh, that's the way it works. And they see the connection, which at least to me is, is a good starting point. doesn't mean that you gain the trust. That's more like you're saying a time aspect where, where uh, you know, the, the practical activities where you prove yourself, if that answers your question.
Well, I want to thank the panel uh, for a very instructive session. <clears throat> I learned quite a bit and caught up on things that I hadn't really thought about much for a long time, and I really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to break now, and those of you who are interested in the literature of uh, the Sweden and the EU, <laughs> that will start at 4 o'clock. And in the meantime, there are refreshments over here. But before uh, we move in that direction, join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>